This morning, we are going to be continuing our study through 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, would you please open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 4 today. And this is part 2 in our series that I entitled Forged Faith. And as I was backstage and I was spending some time just worshiping and having some quiet time before coming out to teach. I felt like the Lord put some scriptures on my heart that I wanted to share uh, with you today. And in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 36, the author of Hebrews says this, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and Jesus who is coming will come. And will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. And the things that we're seeing in the world today are just indicative of a reality for us as Christians that Jesus is coming very soon. Very soon. You know, we've been talking about it for a long time, a long time. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And, and it's been put off in our own estimation, uh, I think, so much that we kind of have forgotten about the imminent return of Jesus. And we do not want to be found not ready. Today we're going to be looking at one of those seven characteristics that I mentioned last week that Paul would address with Timothy as a must-have. And the one that we're going to be looking at today is soldiering and how soldiers endure hardships. And this is a very, very important thing for us today because hardship is really the number one tool that Satan will use to discourage Christians, to cause us to compromise our faith, and to even in some cases lead people astray where they backslide or they completely walk away from the Lord. You know, what's interesting is that most atheists, and I would say in the high 90 percentile, that most atheists had at one point believed in God. And they asked God for something, they said a prayer for something, and it did not happen. And it immediately sent them on this path of rejecting God. And I can tell you in my own experience, and I hope that maybe you would be able to show some sympathy and understanding that if you ever come across somebody that is an atheist, and maybe you're an atheist here today or watching this service as it goes out, that I would ask you, when was the point in time that you stopped believing? When was that point? And usually, if you ask somebody that question, it opens up a great conversation for you to be able to talk about something that the enemy may have used in their life up until this point to get them to hate God, to be angry at him, or to walk away from him. Again, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and I didn't plan on sharing these things. Like I said, I was just backstage and I felt like the Lord wanted me to share this. It says in verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews, therefore we also since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross us, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is our example, Jesus, who endured the cross. We too must endure hardships as a good soldier, as we're going to look at today. This last week, I had the great privilege of attending the Calvary Chapel Association's International Pastors Conference at Raul Reese's church in Diamond Bar. And we had over a thousand different pastors and leaders that were from all over the country and around the world that were there gathered together. And it was such a huge, huge conference. It was so impactful in my life. And it was so sweet to be able to see that we belong to something that is so much greater than our amazing church here. That we are part of a huge 
work of God that is happening around the world. And I felt like the Lord encouraged me in such a way that he says, we need to go forward. It's time to go. It's time to move. And so I'm hoping today, as it just seems so timely with what we're going to be looking at today, that we have that we will collectively as a church and then individually say, you know what? If I have been weighted down by sin, if I have allowed difficulties to ensnare me so that I'm no longer trusting in the Lord and that I'm not doing what God has called me to do, that today would be the day where you say, I'm going to lay aside those things. I'm going to drop those weights. I'm going to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, instead of looking unto my problems or my difficulties. And so today, we're going to be picking up right where we left off. If you missed last week, as I mentioned already, Paul is communicating this very special message to Timothy. I said there are seven things that Paul is telling Timothy you need to have. These are on your must-have lists of characteristics. They're foundational for your spiritual growth and your ministry. If you missed last week, last Sunday, we looked at the subject of stewardship. That Timothy was to be found a faithful steward, to be faithful with what God had entrusted him with. And as God's grace was working through Timothy, in Timothy, he would leave the outcomes to the Lord as simple obedience would fall upon him. You know, often we worry about the outcome. The Lord just says, obey me, trust in me, give it to me, I'll take care of the outcome. Stewardship. And it's through our obedience to the Lord, not worrying about what happens next, but just simple faith carried out through obedience that we find the foundation for good stewardship. In your family, your marriage, your finances, your resources, your, your relationships, whatever it might be. And so Timothy was to view his calling and his service unto the Lord and his ministry as a steward of something that did not belong to him but something that God had entrusted him with. What has God entrusted you with today? I wonder what it is. If you've ever wondered if what you're doing for the Lord or what you've been entrusted with mattered at all, then you're definitely going to want to catch up on our last study if you missed it. But today in our new section, we now see the second characteristic, verse 3, that Timothy would need to own in order to push through the difficult and challenging times of ministry. And section one, characteristic number two, is as a soldier. In verse three, Paul writes and says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. When you read that, I had to immediately do a little self-evaluation, a little self-reflection. And I've realized that most people have a hard time enduring hardships. I know I do. I might even go as far to say that all of us, in some degree, have a hard time enduring hardships. And I think, quite frankly, it's due to the fact that we just don't like them. I don't like having bad days or having, you know, opposition or having th those difficulties. I don't think any of us does uh, do it. It goes without saying. And I think understanding that our Christian life is a spiritual battle and our role as a soldier is that very thing that we are soldiers is very enlightening since we are so soft. Yes, I said it. We are soft. In the United States of America, our Christianity is very soft. And our cush lives and our lack of real spiritual persecution has caused us to get soft. And you know what? We should despise that softness. We don't want to be the weak link. And we avoid being the weak link, which I would just say is a, a huge travesty by enduring hardships. You know, our hardships compared to what happens around the world are so minor. But as we endure hardships as they come and sometimes live with enduring hardships that we have to overcome daily, we find our need of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because we don't like to endure hardships. 
I mean, looking out at you guys today, and here you are at church, I wonder what it is that you're enduring. I wonder what hardships you're facing, whether at work or with health or with fear or anxiety, whether it's somebody that just doesn't like you and they live their entire life just to, you know, try to attack you and antagonize you. I wonder what you're enduring today. Maybe it's a relationship that's strained. Maybe it's a relationship with a spouse or a family member or a child, son or daughter. And you're enduring it. All the things that Paul has endured that we know of his life through reading through the New Testament were done so by the grace of the Lord at work in his life. That's why he told Timothy in our last section, he said, Timothy, stay strong in the grace of the Lord. Do not rely on your own strength to endure hardships or to fulfill your ministry or to follow after the Lord. Because you're going to have to endure when things get hard. You cannot quit. And you cannot allow, and I might just say that the key word is allow, you can't allow discouragement to overwhelm you. And if you've ever been discouraged, you know how overwhelming it can be. You know how paralyzing it can be. You know how hard it is to get up out of bed and how you go to sleep with that pressure and you wake up with it and you're just looking for the ray of sunshine somewhere in this cosmic darkness of your existence. And we forget there's a God. We forget that God is in control of all things, that he's with us, he'll never leave us or forsake us. And we wonder how we're going to make it through these hardships that we face. And they're breaking. There are going to be a lot of things that are sent by the devil to trip you up, to slow you down, to hurt you to make you feel like you're incapable of moving forward. There are going to be things that are so heart-wrenching, so confusing, that you'll wonder why would God allow such things to happen in your life if he really loved you. It may even cause you to feel emotional, where you feel like, how is this happening to me? You have to understand that if the devil can't get you with disobedience, he's going to try to get you with discouragement. You think about it with the things that are in the world today. Why would anyone in their right mind decide to give of themselves for the work of the ministry? Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody volunteer their time? Why would somebody invest in something when it costs so much? When it seems like it's easier to be nominal, to be lukewarm, to be uh, mediocre or to just stay on the sideline. Why would anyone in their right mind sacrifice all the luxuries of a mega church to be involved with serving at a church plant? I wonder about that, especially in our area. What a special group of people it is that God has entrusted us with. What a special group of people you are. And as we've joked about over the last almost eight years, and you sit in those junior high school sized chairs every Sunday. And God has been doing a great work here, and He's called us not to fail, but to succeed. He didn't call us to be weak. He didn't call you to be weak, but to be strong. God did not call us to the easy tasks, but to the important, necessary ones. Now, I have a huge respect for all of our military, our service men and women, active, reserved, retired. We stand behind our troops because they stand in front of us. My grandfather was in World War II. Some of my closest friends and buddies were in the military. Soldiers don't sign up for a life of ease. They sign up to make a difference. They sign up to live a life filled with purpose and meaning and sacrifice for the greater work that's at play. 
And so too, those that serve the Lord must endure hardships as a good soldier. And a good soldier knows how to obey commands. A good soldier knows how to look out for his teammates and to do what is necessary for the accomplishment of the goal without giving up. Wouldn't it be awful if our special teams shot each other? Wouldn't that be just a terrible thing to have take place? If you think about the church and how often the church shoots one another, that's not being a good soldier. Now, I know this is going to sound like a crazy number to you, but I want to give you some sort of reference for what we go through week in and week out and how good God is and how worthy he is to be praised. Because we have had our ebbs and flows. We've had our ups and downs. We've had, you know, inside, outside, Zoom, and then, you know what, we're going to have, you know, church in a Korean church parking lot over the summer, whatever it might be, and we've been all over the place. Now, I think that's why I started getting a lot of white hair in my beard just because of this last year or so. I'm going to know this is going to sound like a crazy number, though, but approximately 3,700 churches close every year, and half of them are new churches. Every year. 37, 3,700 churches close every year, and half of them, so it was that 1,850, are new churches. So Timothy, you're leading a church, endure hardships. Follower of Jesus, you're leading your home, you're leading your children, you're leading your family. You're a light in your work and in your neighborhood, your community. Endure hardships. In Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, it says, Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, I wish I could have godly character without having perseverance. I wish my faith could increase and I could say I am a mighty man of faith and I've never had one bad day in my life. Unfortunately, great faith goes hand in hand with great hardship. You endure those hardships, it refines your character, and then you find that your hope is only in the Lord. Perseverance character, character hope. I always remember that, that little transition because we live in Southern California and Pacific Coast Highway is PCH. I'll never forget perseverance, character, hope. So what does it say, though, to those you're leading, those that might look to you as an example? And you know what's interesting about this as well is that most of us don't realize that there are people that are outside of our circle, let's say immediate circle, that are actually looking to you to be encouraged. And you might think, oh, well, you know, who am I? I'm just some nobody and I show up to church and whatever, you know, I don't really talk to many people or I'm not super involved or I'm not up on stage or whatever it might be. Do you realize that there are people that are watching you and they're encouraged by you? When they see your love for the Lord and the love for your family and when they see your faithfulness to show up to be in church, and then they see you across the aisle and, oh, there's so-and-so. It's great to see them and it encourages them. Because outside of these four walls, we get discouraged. It's, it's real life out there. We're in this world. Yeah, we're not of it, but we're still in it. And we still endure those terrible things that happen on a daily. On the daily. But what does it say to those that you're leading when you quit when it gets hard? Or when it gets inconvenient, what precedent are we setting? What example are we setting? You know, I was raised in a home where we don't quit things. I hated that in some cases growing up. Because I was involved with certain things that I committed to and I didn't like it. But my dad said, we don't quit. If you committed to something, then you see it out. That carried me through seventh grade basketball, NJB in Fountain Valley. That carried me through college when I wanted to drop out of Bible school. And it's carried me ever since. See, it's at those times that you feel like quitting that you must press in like never before. You don't need to raise your hand, but do you feel like quitting? Do you feel like giving up? Do you feel like it's too much to bear? 
Do you just say, man, I'm over it. I am over it. And, you know, just be real with yourself and say, yeah, I'm having a bad attitude and I know it, but I'm sick of it. I wonder how many of you have ever said anything like that. But it's at those times, as a follower of Jesus, when you feel like you just can't go on. When you feel like quitting. You have to press in. It's when you don't want to do it that you should especially do it. If you've committed to follow the Lord and you don't feel like it or you feel discouraged or you're like, not today, you need to make sure that you press in. Because listen, soldiers get tired. Soldiers feel discouraged. But soldiers don't quit when the battle gets hard. Soldiers are there for when the battle gets hard. Soldiers are push to go beyond their own limits, to go until they can't go any further, and then they take 10 more steps. You know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we support our Marines at Camp Pendleton. I love what Anita and Gary are doing down there and others. It is not an easy life. When it comes to spiritual things, listen to what I'm about to say. Our spiritual training and conditioning comes through hardships. Hardship forges your faith. It's not pleasant, but it's true. Every difficult experience you have, everything that challenges your faith or would lead you to question God's faithfulness to you is really the refining fire of the Lord at work in your life, and you are going to come through it stronger than you were when you entered in. But if we allow distractions or influences to hinder our spiritual growth or ministry, then we are failing in our soldiering. I don't know if this is a profound question, It was to me, because I wondered how many of us do something because it's difficult? I'm going to do this because actually it's challenging for me. I'm going to do this because it's hard. Now you might think, are you out of your ever living mind? Do things because it's difficult. Difficulty, having difficulty is good for you. It's good for you. It's good for me. Staying committed to what the Lord has called me to do in the midst of it is exceptional. Exceptional. Challenged. How does growth come? Through challenge, through hardship. You don't grow without hardship. It's impossible. It's in every area of life. How are you going to grow in your knowledge if you don't endure the hardship of great study? How are you going to grow in your physical strength if you don't endure the hardship of adding an extra plate on the bar? How are you going to grow in your spiritual conditioning and maturity if you never have to exercise your faith, if you never have to step outside the boat, if you never actually have to trust in the Lord because you never endure or experience any hardships that you would have to endure? So enduring difficulty, facing challenges without giving up, cause great spiritual growth. And Paul didn't want Timothy to be caught off guard and thinking, hey, now you're in a place of spiritual authority and maturity. You know, your life should be at ease. Quite the opposite. He said, you need to endure hardships as a good soldier. You know, as you probably know, Paul and Timothy lived in the Roman Empire. Rome. It's known for their warriors. When you would look at a soldier, you would see somebody who is used to victory. 
you would see somebody that endured rigorous training, that was in lockstep with their commanding centurion. Timothy, you've seen a visual, you've seen a visual of what a Roman soldier looks like. You know you don't want to mess with those guys. You need to be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ and you need to endure good soldier of the Lord. In verse 3, endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I'd like you just to look real quickly at the connection. To connect the ability of enduring hardships with what Paul told Timothy to draw his strength from. It's actually in verse 1. If you look at it, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So good soldiers of Jesus Christ endure hardships by being strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. How does this work? If you would notice, it has nothing to do with your ability. It actually means that you're in over your head and your ability to handle the situation has fallen short and you must rely on the grace of Jesus to get you through it, to give you what you need in your time of need. Now, you want to hear something that's really interesting? I kind of chuckled at this when I was reading it. As you know, the New Testament is written in Greek. This phrase or this coupled uh, words, good soldier, in the Greek language can be translated beautiful to look at or genuine. Beautiful to look at. You must endure hardships as someone that's beautiful to look at or somebody that's genuine. Now, listen, Paul's not saying, Timothy, if you're a handsome follower of Jesus, you're going to need to endure hardships. And as Timothy reads that, he ponders what a curse it is to be ridiculously good-looking and a follower of Jesus. The key point is that a genuine follower of Jesus will endure hardships. You will endure. So really, the, the, the genuineness of our faith is displayed or the lack thereof, for that matter, when hardships arise. I like to read to you from Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. Many of you are familiar with it. But in Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9, and then we'll hop down for 18 through 21, Jesus said, Behold, a sower went out to sow. It means he's casting seed on his field. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. In verse 7 of Matthew 13, it says, And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And Jesus said, He who has Ears to hear, let him hear. And down in verse 18, Jesus explains the spiritual significance of that parable. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who, listen to this, hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word or because of his relationship with the Lord, immediately he stumbles. Immediately he stumbles. So the seed is the word of God. And those that are not genuine followers of Jesus will stumble when difficulties associated with their faith arise. For some of us, that should pierce us to our hearts. That's me. I've done that. It got difficult. 
and I didn't respond like somebody who was filled with the Spirit and who was a man or woman of faith, the difficulties arose. And I had no depth to my character, no depth to my faith. I had no root in the Word of God. Hardships, they're double-edged. They're double-edged. On one side, the devil would seek to strip you of your faith so that you're like Job's wife. Why don't you just curse God and die? Man, following Jesus has been a real winner, hasn't it? Because look, you don't have a job. Look, you're struggling in your health. Look, your relationship is falling apart. Curse God and die. Why would you even think that following Jesus was something that you should be doing? But on the other side, the Lord would seek to strengthen your life. Strengthen your faith and empower you. Like I said, difficulties are a double-edged sword. Are you seeing it cut you down? Or are you seeing it cut away your flesh, your sinful nature? The devil would seek to destroy your relationship with Jesus, Jesus would seek to destroy your relationship with sin. Which one are you a product of today? If you are not just playing church and going through the motions, you must ask yourself this question honestly. Will we be found to be the real, genuine article or just a shallow shell of a soldier of the Lord. And you know, as we march through different seasons of life, it's important to ask ourselves these questions. For most of us, we understand the difference between a war and a battle. The war is the big picture. The battles are all of those little skirmishes that make the war, and they're on different fronts, and they happen all over the place. We are prepared for spiritual warfare by fighting our own little battles. You know, in full disclosure, because I feel like these things that I read and I prepare for and I study the Lord speaks to me through his word because it's living. And I have to confess that there have been so many things in my life that initially I thought they were major wars. Man, I'm really just going through the ringer. This is like next level warfare. Only to find out that I was still in the peewee leagues. <laughs> Yet God in his great grace that we're to be strong in, as Paul told Timothy, in his great grace... The Lord allows us to grow and mature at a pace that we will survive. He will not allow us to be tested beyond that which we're able to bear. And that is true. But a shallow faith leads to a shallow grave. So we must rise to the challenge. And back to what I said about a, you know, a good soldier being handsome as one uh, translation kind of gives you more of a, a broader definition of what this couple of words might mean in the Greek language. You know, it can actually be translated beautiful to look at. And as funny as it might be in talking about, hey, you know, if you're a true soldier of Jesus Christ, then you must be a very good looking person. What he's saying here, and if we're honest with each other, like, seriously, think about this because I think it's just so realistic. When you see someone going through a great hardship, like I know some of you are, when you see someone else as a follower of Jesus enduring great hardship and they're strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus, we must admit that it's a beautiful sight. We're mesmerized. We're in awe. How is that person still moving forward? 
How is it that they could endure such pain and such difficulty and still walk with the Lord? You look at that person and you're in amazement. And so I think that that is a very appropriate translation of that Greek couple of words, that somebody that's enduring hardship as a good soldier is somebody that you want to watch, that encourages you. And even you would say to yourself, I want to be just like that. I want to emulate that person. And when a Christian is stewarding their calling and fulfilling their commission as a good soldier, enduring hardships, it's such a pleasing thing to the Lord that it inspires all those around them. I mean, how many times have we read in the annals of history of acts of courage and valor that inspired people for ages to come going beyond, doing the difficult, never giving up. And how those acts inspired millions and millions of people throughout history. When you've read of them and you think, if he can do it, I can do it. What an amazing man, what an amazing woman. For the follower of Jesus, that is possible for you if you remain strong in the grace of the Lord. In verse 4 it says, And no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I'll say personally, for a pastor to be entangled in things outside of the ministry is not right. Because whether you realize it or not, there are so many side gigs, if you will, that pastors can get involved with that actually take away their ability to minister effectively, where it becomes a compromise. But in Acts 6, we found a remedy for such distractions, and it says, in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. There were some ministry things and some practical things that were falling through the cracks. And the 12 disciples summoned the multitude of the followers of Jesus and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. These are the most important things for the pastor and leader of the church. And yes, granted, especially in church startups, you're wearing a lot of different hats, but I've been so blessed to have such an amazing team of men and women that do such a fantastic job in serving in so many ways. But it's not only side projects that can cause the pastor or the Christian to be distracted. There are things that we encounter that are meant to distract us from that which is the most important. Have you noticed in your own life how it's so easy to get entangled with things that don't matter? When you think about it, have you been in an argument and at the end of it thought, what am I even arguing about? Have you found yourself so preoccupied by things that, you know, your physical state is affected? Your emotions get entangled. Your thoughts get entangled. You know, through addictions, through bad thoughts and, you know, deceptive feelings, we find ourselves incapacitated for spiritual work. I find that inserting ourselves into other people's private or personal affairs is an entanglement. I find that worrying about what other people think of you or say about you is an entanglement. I believe that thinking too highly of yourself is an entitlement entrapment. So a good soldier lays aside anything that could cost him his life and he's trained to do so. In the Roman sense of the use of this passage, it would mean that a soldier didn't do anything that would cause his skill as a soldier to diminish. Rome was very strict 
with certain aspects of their soldiers' lives. He would be fully committed to training and refining his skill as a formidable warrior because if he did not, the next battle he could die or it could cost the lives of those that were around him. Everything the Roman soldier did was for the sole purpose of fighting and being a good soldier. It also meant that he wasn't to be double-minded. He had one task at hand and he had one thing alone to focus on. He was not divided in his heart nor in his actions. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So as we close, ultimately, you just want to be pleasing to the Lord. Faithfulness in our stewardship of what the Lord has entrusted us with is pleasing to the Lord, whether large or small, significant or seemingly insignificant. So no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So there should be nothing, as I read in Hebrews, that trips us up from serving the Lord. If it comes down to me following the Lord or whatever this may be, whatever this may be needs to go. Otherwise, it's a weight. It will hold me down. It will trip me up. Additionally, we see at the end of verse 4, that living a life free from the entanglements of sin and the distractions of unimportant things enable us to be pleasing to him who enlisted us as a good soldier. And I don't want to be a bad soldier. I want to be a good soldier. And the good ones endure difficulties and hardships and in so doing are a beautiful sight to behold. So I want to encourage you today. A follower of Jesus will face hardships. Some of you may be losing your little battles over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so Satan says, I've got them. And I'm going to keep hitting them there again and again and again until you adjust. And so if there's some adjustments that need to be made today, then so be it. If the Lord has shown you some things in your life that are weaknesses, are chinks in the armor, are vulnerabilities, or the like, then it's time to tighten up. It's time to put on the whole armor of God. It's time to not allow difficulties to trip you up. God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's through those hardships you're going to see his life, his power revealed in your life. Difficulties are not a bad thing. Do we like them? No. Do we sign up for them? Yes, we'll have a list in the back. You can put your name down. No, we don't. So thank God that he alone knows what we can handle. And if you're going through it today, then you need to endure. We will pray for you. We will walk with you. As much as is within our power, we'll help you. But there are some things that you have to walk through, just you and the Lord. So allow him. Allow him to have his perfect work accomplished in your life. Listen, there are times that I have felt that God has walked me right into the middle of a crisis. And it was so far beyond me and my ability, I didn't even have the capacity to process the things that were happening around me. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this happening? And then you know, right there in my ear, pastor or no pastor, is the voice of the devil or one of his minions, those fiery darts. God's not true to his word, is he? God's not going to come through for you. Why would God allow this? I thought you had a real relationship with the Lord. Look at all those things that are happening. How could you feel like that if you were truly saved? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. And Satan is the father of all lies, and that's why Jesus said, he pulls lies from his own bag. He's the father of them all. And what does that cause us to do as good soldiers of Christ? We go back to our training. Where does our training come from? When you're in the middle of the crisis, what do you fall back on? The word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or not felt. 
So maybe you don't see it and maybe you don't feel it. That doesn't change who God is. Don't rely on your physical senses to discern spiritual truths. They're discerned in the spirit. And so, as we close, we're going to pray. And as Pastor Steve announced, there'll be a prayer team up here in the front, my right, your left. If you need prayer for anything, please take advantage of it. But right now, I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes and bow your head. We're going to close out the teaching portion of our morning together with prayer. And I'm just going to ask that if you're having a difficult time, and you need a touch from the Lord today, that with every eye closed and head bowed, maybe you're carrying a burden, maybe you've been enduring something for some time and you're worn out. I want you to know that God sees. He's very well aware of it. He's going to come through for you at the appointed time. It may not be in your timeline, but it will be on his timeline and it will be perfect. You don't see it now. You don't understand it now. But you will look back at this time and you will see the hand of God upon you. But if that's you today and you're in the thick of it, and you would like a special just touch from the Lord today, I'd like to pray for you. And I'm going to ask that you would just raise your hand and say, yes, Garrett, would you please pray for me? Would you hold your hand up so I can pray for you? Whatever it is, if you're going through something, and even as you're lifting up your hand, just picture your burden falling at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to pray for you right now. And I, I know that the Lord's going to minister to you. Father, I pray for these. They're your sons. They're your daughters. Lord, you've called them to endure hardships as a good soldier. And Lord, their endurance is going to be looked upon not only by you as a pleasing thing, but by those around them. Lord, some here today have gotten to the end of themselves. They have realized that there is not one single good thing that they are capable of doing in this circumstance. And with that frustration, and with that discouragement, I pray, Lord, that you would show yourself strong on their behalf. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. If they have unconfessed sin in their life, Lord, may they confess it to you and find that you're faithful and just to forgive them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And Lord, may they look unto you, the author and finisher of their faith. Lord, I pray that you would move in their circumstance, eyes focused on you. And Lord, even as the devil may be tempting them to just curse you and die or to walk away or to give up hope, I pray, Lord, that they would hold fast to you. Encourage, encourage them today, Lord. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. May the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, may he be gracious unto you, and may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.